<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, let's start now, I guess. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to say good evening for all of you in Indonesia, and also good morning for all of you in the United States, and good afternoon for all of you in Europe. So, yeah, it's totally three different times and three different places. So, I guess um, uh, during this pandemic, I I hope you are all in a great healthiness and happiness, of course, and that's all we can do these days during the during the quarantine days. So yeah, uh, if not because of pandemic, for sure, uh, we we can we we might not doing this, you know, to reducing the distance between us. I mean, uh, I'm from I'm in Indonesia and the other one in New York and the other one in Europe. It's, it's quite possible for doing it uh, quite oftenly these days. And yeah, I would like to introduce my name. Uh, my name is Randy Hendrawan. Uh, oh, before that, uh, every every of you could hear me well, right? Uh, Unet, Alishan, is my yes, voice okay? Yes, yes, we hear you, Randy. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, let me introduce my name. My name is Randy Hendrawan. Uh, I was born and raised in Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, I was graduated in this university in Surabaya. It's called ITS, Institute of Technology School, November, and finishing my master's degree in Politecnico Milan in Sede di Mantua uh, for architecture design and history degree. So yeah, uh, I will be your host and moderator tonight. And I'm behalf of a few of my friends from Rabu Mada who organized this. And also uh, the Pratt Institute also that partly organized uh, for the publication and, and also to lend us the Zoom. It's very nice. And also uh, I would like to, to, to tell the story behind the background behind the, uh, why why we we are making this uh, weekly series lecture? Uh, actually, it's uh, we were st we were started hanging out. Few, me and my friends from Rabu Mada, we start hanging out like two years ago. Uh, we were working in the same studio, um, and then that's how we started hanging out together. And then after we finish uh, we finish working in that studio, we start to hanging out around and start to to aim to start our own studios and also start to mix some workshops, some architectural workshops, some pedagogy workshops. And then uh, last year, uh, we were we were also, few of us were selected to as a, as a curator for Indonesian Pavilion for the upcoming La Biennale Venezia. And also, yeah, that's, that's how we hang around. But yeah, uh, it's, it started when we, were, when we were still working on this uh, Indonesian Pavilion for, for the upcoming Biennale. Uh, sadly, it has to stop. We, we has to stop working because of this pandemic, and also uh, still a big question about how how we 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 still going to continue our our uh, our progress for 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 La Biennale. So during that time, we we cannot do anything in the house. We quite quarantined, just working from home, and it's it's quite sadly because some of the project is halted. I guess it's also happened to everyone. Also, it's also not only us who screw up, the whole world have the same experience like this. So yeah, so uh, all of us started to, to playing this, you know, these cheap games, you know, it's okay from A to Z, uh, let's, let's list thing from A to Z, who's, who are uh, listing with the, the, the international architects, right? So yeah, we start with that. Uh, we finish in a few days and yeah, that's how we have this, this, uh, this list, if, if you can see from our poster, that's uh, this like a puzzle game that we made. And we, 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 we like to taking it uh, a little bit to another thing. How about we pick one guy to talk about another guy, one guy to talk about an architect. It's very simple, right? So I start with the first series uh, with Alfaro Siza because I, uh, Soto de Moro was teaching me before in, when I was studying in Italy and uh, he teaches us many things about Alfaro Cisa, so I, I tell them a few things I knew. And yeah, that's how we start the lectures every week. And now we are in the eighth series, uh, talking about Peter Eisenman. And this is our second international session, actually. Uh, the first one we did last month with, with, with Luis Barragan. I, we invited my, my, my friend from Mexico uh, to talk about Luis Barragan. Because that's how we started until now. Uh, that's how I reached Ali Chantal. I was thinking to to invite him because, uh, yeah, that's that's how finally I invite Alishan. And 
Okay, uh, thanks again for Alishan for taking this small lecture uh, into the whole, uh, to another level, you know. Uh, I would like to introduce now, uh, no, not, not introduce, to, to, to tell the story how me and Alishan met, wh how I, why we invited him actually. Started uh, two years ago uh, in 2018, I was studying and living in, in this small city in Italy called Mantua, uh, uh, where, where Leon Battista Alberti had his two of his important works. Uh, on that time, I applied for this workshop in, in Turkish Pavilion in La Biennale. Uh, Venezia in 2018. Uh, the, the name of the pavilion is Fardia. I guess one of the curators is here also, Ardentism. And uh, that's how we met. We joined in the same class of the workshop in Turkish Pavilion in 2018. Uh, at the time, I guess, uh, Alison was just graduated from Pratt Institute and I just graduated from Politecnico Milan. And um, yeah, he was re still recently working in, Eisen in Eisenman, I guess. So that's how we've met. Uh, it's very nice because uh, during the, the one week of workshop, we, we did also the group work together. Uh, it's very, it was fun because we were, uh, we had this three mentor from ETH Zurich. We were working uh, some, uh, to designing some landscape, uh, parametrical design on the, on the landscape and on the sand uh, medium with this robotic arm, which is, I know nothing because I was studying about history and Alicia and know everything so basically Alishan did everything so but during the lunch time of course uh, we we did many architecture discussion and stuff and uh, we, we were staying in the, the whole week in, in Palladian uh, Palladian monastery uh, in the El Redentore in Judica it was very nice but really really hot at the time because it's, it wasn't August but may, after after that workshop we, we still keep in touch so that's how I actually invite uh, Alishan about a month ago, I guess, to 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 organize this uh, this uh, meeting, yeah, and uh, so for the A to Z invitation, uh, there must be interesting to. That's why I invite Alishan. There must be interesting to to speak about uh, Peter Eisman. He was working there uh, for two years before, and uh, it must be nice to know uh, Peter Eisman from his very practical point of view so that's what we were thinking okay so you were working there and uh, tell us about something about the, your experiences and how the methodological uh, are applied in the design and stuff uh, again thanks again for Alishan for taking these small weekly lectures into the whole new, <laughs> the whole new level you know uh, which how he invites uh, other former architects uh, and also who are recently working now from different generation uh, he also he invited Thomas Leeser, Ariane Harrison, Artem Tuzun, and Alice Turbe. Uh, but later I will introduce them. Uh, they will join our own, a virtual roundtable discussion. Um, but the most in, uh, the most important thing is uh, he also invited our special guest of honor tonight, which is Mr. Eisenman himself. Uh, I guess Peter is here, right? Yeah, I think he is here. Maybe Peter could say hi. Wait a minute. No, no, you're okay. No. I'm okay. Oh, you're okay. Okay, I'm okay. Okay. Uh, Technology. <laughs> yeah, me too, actually. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you for coming. Actually, uh, before before I will uh, let you for for say some words, I would like to to mention about your bio, maybe before for that, just to general things, because uh, maybe this is your will be your first uh, your your first. Uh, Indonesian audience. We are from Indonesia. We were, we never had you in the, in the public lecture before Indonesia. So in virtually, maybe we're going to just do this small small introduction. Okay. Uh, wait. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's it's actually it's really great. We were expecting the whole week for this. Um, I uh, actually we we have met before. Uh, once was in, in 2017, I guess, in Milano Design Week. I was studying in, in this small city called Mantua, but uh, the Politecnico Milano campus always held the, the, some lectures during the Milano Design Week and also in Rome. So uh, very nice lectures, I, I guess. And uh, before you start the speech today, I would like to tell some general stuff maybe. And yeah, and maybe later it will be explained by Alicia. So yeah. Uh, Peter David Eisenman was born in 1932 in Newark, New Jersey, United States. Uh, he's an American architect who 
uh, known for his radical designs and architectural theories. One of his ideas was published in the Constructivist uh, Exhibition in 1988, together with other renowned architects, such as uh, Frank Gehry, Saadi, in memoriam, uh, Rem Kolhas, uh, Jen Lipskin, Bernard Schumi, and the firm Coop Himmel Blow at the International Exhibition created by Philip Johnson. And since then, he is often characterized as the Constructivist uh, architect. Eisenman holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Cornell University, a Master of Science in Architecture degree from Columbia University, uh, and also his PhD degree from Cambridge University where he met uh, his, his mentor, Colin Rowe. Um, he also holds honorary doctorates from fine arts from the University of Illinois, Chicago, the Pratt Institute in New York, and Syracuse University. He also recently teaches at visiting professor at Yale University and Cooper Union. Pito still recently works as, as the principal architect in Eisenman Architects, as we know, already produced some of critical works such as the House Six, House Series, uh, the Wexner Center for the Arts, Greater Columbus Convention Center, uh, the Holocaust Memorial of Berlin, the City of Culture of Par uh, in Galicia, the Unicapi Archaeological Museum in Istanbul, the Apartment and Via Carlo Erbe in Milan, and many other important works in all over the world. Not only he transformed his idea into architectural project. He also published Diagram Diaries in 1999 as one of his manifesto in a form book. His later writing include Eisenman Inside Out, selected writings in 1963 until 1988 in 2004. Uh, and also Peter Eisenman Barefoot on White Hot Walls in 2005, edited by Peter Neuver and written into the void, selected writings 1990 until 2004 in 2007. Okay, I guess that's enough for the introduction. We don't wait too long. I don't believe, I don't believe I'm saying this, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome our guest introduction speaker, uh, Mr. Peter Eisenman himself. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce my own work. Uh, this is, uh, makes me feel rather strange. I'm not sure that I'm either here or there, uh, and um, I'm not sure that I'm supposed to be doing this, but here it is. I want to just briefly speak uh, as an introduction as to how I got to, how I got here. And there are several key moments in my development that I think are important. One. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a great designer, and I thought to be a designer and a great designer, uh, one had to uh, know work for great designers. Um, and I went to work for Walter Gropius in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I got out of the U.S. Army. Um, and after being there for six months, I realized that this was not the direction I wanted to go in. And so I transferred from that office, which was a rather commercial office, uh, to doing a graduate degree. I still wanted to be a great designer. And then by chance, I happened to have dinner in my first semester with uh, the English architect, Jim Sterling. I didn't know who Jim Sterling was. He probably wasn't anybody when I first met him in 1959. Um, but he, um, we, I showed him a project that I was working on, a um, housing project. And he said to me, having met the first time, he said, Peter, you're a terrific designer but you don't know anything about architecture. And I thought, what does he mean? I don't know anything about architecture if I'm a very good designer. Uh, and that bothered me because I didn't know the difference between knowing something about architecture and being a good designer. Uh, a little later, a year, year and a half later, I happened to be traveling in Italy with Colin Rowe, the first time I had been to Italy. I'd never seen uh, any of the Palladio works. And Colin put me in front of a Palladian villa. Uh, Montagnana, I think, was the first uh, villa that we saw in the summer of, of 61. And he stood me in the, 
uh, sort of heat of uh, 35, 40 degrees centigrade. And he said, you stand there uh, and look at the facade until you can tell me something about that facade that you cannot see. And I again was stunned. I said, what does he mean by cannot see? Uh, of course, I can see everything. And I stood there and it took me quite a long time before I could understand what Roe meant. That, that there were two aspects to actual architecture. One, the physical form itself, the walls, columns, facades, but then the space itself. And that the space was very important. Um, that was a, a seminal moment. I went back to Cambridge uh, and from that moment on, I decided I wanted to be a theoretician. I wrote a theory a thesis on the formal basis of modern architecture. I studied uh, four different architects, Le Corbusier, Giuseppe Terrani, Alvar Alto, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and I developed a, a really difficult and important interest in uh, formal analysis uh, and precedent in architecture. And the important thing that I discovered was that what makes what I do different, let's say from other friendly architects, is that um, I'm studying uh, space as opposed to studying form, actually. And I treat space and absence, let's say, as opposed to presence as form, the one. But then I'm very much interested in the formal meaning. And the formal meaning is uh, one which uh, has nothing to do with um, traditional ideas of uh, learning from Las Vegas, let's say. It has to do with the internal uh, autonomous notion of the sign. And so where my work uh, deviates from uh, other work is that I'm interested in the sign systems that are autonomous, that is, that are dealing with the formal internal logic of a project. Um, that's an introduction that would then lead you to hours of looking at drawings and study to understand what I'm saying, but perhaps uh, the group, who many of whom have worked with me, uh, will be able to explain what I meant. But again, thank you for inviting me, and uh, let's have a good day. Well, thank you very much for your uh, remarkable works, I guess. Uh, I can say I also expecting of your new book about Alberti. I was staying for two years in Mantua, and I'm really Coming. expecting... <laughs> Coming. Yeah, because... you. <laughs> because you told me that Alberti is the first uh, writer who actually uh, talking about the epistemology of space. Oh, that, that one is the dummy. <laughs> okay. I also, I also have a new book that came just uh, fr last Friday called Lateness mm -hmm. with Elisa Turby, who is with you. Um, and uh, it uh, carries on the kind of thinking uh, that uh, I was doing before. And Elisa worked with me for several years and uh, a shout out to her because this is really uh, a book that's uh, got a lot to do with her work. So uh, thank you. Really cool. Yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for the time. And before you leave the meeting, maybe on behalf of our Indonesian architects or on behalf of Indonesian students who were really inspired by you, I would love to say thank you for all those things that you, done it i mean for 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 those beautiful works for books theories articles lectures and of course those beautiful drawings and diagrams thank you uh, i do believe someday we we will meet uh I, we will meet and maybe in indonesia i don't know maybe you will start your your works your first work in indonesia i don't know good for the influences you know from this other part of the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah thank you mr peter eisenman uh, uh have a good day. Uh, okay, uh, we're moving to our main speaker, Alishan Thailand, uh, our main speaker tonight. Uh, 
before he start, maybe I will I will mention also his bio. You know, I already told you uh, how we've met actually in Venice. Uh, I would like to also explain to you before before the pres his presentation. So Ali Thailand is an architect and engineer born in 1991 in Turkey. He holds a master of engineering from the National Institute of Applied Science in Lyon, France, and a master of architecture from the Pratt Institute, New York. Uh, prior to working in architecture, he has worked as a naval designer. He has later worked in the offices of Peter Eisenman, uh, Shigeru Ban, and Thomas Leeser, where he currently uh, practices. He co-teaches with Thomas Leeser an advanced graduate design studio at Pratt Institute in New York. He recently curated an exhibition, which is Aesthetic of Prosthetics, at Pratt Institute's uh, Siegel Gallery and published uh, a project in Log 47. So I guess that's all for the bio. So I would love to please my old friend to start with his presentation. Hello, Ali Chan. Hi. Um, Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our main speaker. Uh, Alishan Thailand. Uh, here thank you, Randy. You're, oh, you're doing a great job, really. Uh, thank <laughs> uh, you for the great sorry. introduction. And, Th well, thanks. thanks. I have to uh, so, sorry. In, in, yeah, yeah, in case you have uh, some technical issue with the Zoom, I'll mention it and you, you also could let me know. Okay. Here you go, buddy. All right. Thanks. Uh, so, can we all see the screen? And just the screen? Yes, but not in the full screen, I guess. Is it full screen now? Um, yep, now it's full. Okay. okay. So hi, everyone. I, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And thank you, Randy, for inviting me to this event. I'm very happy to be part of this lecture series. And I hope I can share with you tonight some humble notes on Peter Eisenman's work. It's even more complicated after Peter did this intro himself. The Rabun Mada Collective um, has been doing a great work at organizing this platform that keeps discussion on architecture alive, even in such hard times. I've also realized that presenting in front of an audience online is a bit of a different task. I can't really get any response from you. I'm in my house by myself and I can't tell if you're interested or bored to death. So to start quickly, Eisenman was born in the 30s, a decade marked by the Great Depression, the, word, the worst recession the modern world has perhaps seen. The decade saw the rise of Nazism and ended with the start of the Second World War. And today I would like to talk about Eisenman's architecture in relation to the current global crisis we're undergoing. I think that the times we're living through are quite unique. Like the French philosopher Derrida said, every death is a tragedy. The threshold of death is perhaps the possibility of the impossible. While all my thoughts are with everyone struggling with the disease that the virus is causing, I cannot but think about the world after the pandemic too. And everyone seems to wonder how and when we will return to this quote unquote normal. But our normal world, as we know it, was a world where everything was already wrong to begin with. And I don't want to linger on this too long, but France, for example, passed 25,000 deaths um, last week due to Corona in over two months of struggling with the virus. But 25,000 is also the number of people dying of hunger in the world every day. So even without going too deep into this subject, it looks like our past normal should definitely not be our next normal. And the questioning of what is normal, of what's conventional, of the status quo, has always been a part of Peter Eisenman's work and nature. To give you the simplest everyday example, I remember one day at the office when Peter burst out of the meeting room all irritated and upset about something. We wanted to learn about it. It turned out that during the meeting, the consultant architect we were working with placed his hands in the shape of an upside down V like this to imitate a conventional gabled roof shape 
when he was talking about the roof of the project. And after the architect left, Eisenman went on saying, that's not a roof. Why didn't he do this? And he was asking why he didn't do a straight horizontal line with his hands. So the virus put us in a pretty exceptional spatial organization as a society, one that we will perhaps not live through again. Over a billion people went or are going through a lockdown. This situation made visible a trend in the way we inhabit the city. This trend was started with digitization and only became vivid when we actually couldn't get out of our houses. What I'm referring to is the merging of places of work and leisure, of socializing and family spaces, of cultural against functional spaces. A few decades ago, as recently as the 1970s, philosopher Michel Foucault wrote about the impossibility of this merging. It seemed to him that for the society of his time, these dualities would always remain, that they were inviolable and immutable. I'm referring to Foucault's text of other spaces where he presented his concept of heterotopia. I might refer later to the same text in relation to some of Eisenman's projects because his projects definitely have heterotopic qualities this otherness that is perhaps best apparent in the Jewish Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. I would say that what makes Eisenman unique among his contemporaries is his close reading of architecture in its relationship to the history of ideas. One thing about ideas is that they travel. So I would like in this first part to draw your attention to a lineage, and there are many other lineages, of architectural thought. Heinrich Wölflin was among the first disciples of the art history as a field of study. His writings have been influential for art and architecture, notably through the, his study of artworks through their form. His book, Renaissance and Baroque, suggested that instead of reading the Renaissance and the Baroque periods as completely distinct, one could see them as a continuation. While the circle so present in Renaissance architecture represents an idealized geometry, ellipses of the Baroque became dislocated circles with two centers instead of one. Hence, the centrally planned church of the Renaissance leaves its place to the Baroque elongated nave. Later on, Wittkover, who was a student of Wölflin's for a short year in Munich, did uh, an in-depth study of Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio's work and its relation to 16th century music theory in his book, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism. Wittkover went on to teach at the Warburg Institute in London where a key figure in Eisenman's teaching uh, and training, as we mentioned earlier, Colin Rowe was a student. While Wolflin and Whitcover were both art historians who wrote about architecture too, Colin Rowe was to become an influential architectural historian and theorist. Perhaps his most known essay is The Mathematics of the Ideal Villa where the daring connection between modern architecture and Renaissance architecture is made. Through formal analysis, Rowe connects classical harmonic proportions, such as the ones with Cover covered previously, to the early work of Le Corbusier, to his villas. This is quite a radical reading of modern architecture because until then, modern architecture represented everything that was new, ahistorical. Modern architecture was by definition detached from the classical, departed from it as its manifesto. Eisenman's first book is his PhD thesis, The Formal Basis of Modern Architecture, like he mentioned. In it, we, he analyzes the work of prominent architects. Um, he mentioned four. I, he also looks at others, uh, but I think the four ones are the main ones. Le Corbusier, uh, Giuseppe Teragni, Frankfurt Wright, and Alvar Aalto. 
There's also Paul Rudolph involved and some others. He crafts and applies formal analysis methods as started by Berflin to the buildings he studies. His thesis is illustrated with over 200 hand drawings where one can discern the seeds of his design methodology to come. Axes, vectors, and masses play an important role in his diagramming. He analyzes in detail projects through their planimetric and volumetric qualities. Peter wrote several books, many of which were co-authored with his collaborators. And we're very lucky to have here three architects who co-authored and edited his books. Thomas Laser edited with Jeffrey Kipnis' Coral Works, where Eisenman and Derrida collaborated. Ariane Lurie Harrison edited the book 10 Canonical Buildings, perhaps the most known one. And Elisa co-authored Lateness, which is being released within the next few weeks, I thought, but it seems like it's already out. So don't forget to get your copy to read about late Beethoven and Adorno's theories on lateness, Luce's architecture, and many other intriguing thoughts. We've seen so far a trajectory of ideas that was critical in the formation of Eisenman's architecture. What we haven't seen is any buildings. So here I think it's important to introduce the difference between project and practice, an important duality for Eisenman. Quoting him, he believes that there are two avenues to power in architecture. One is through design, the other is through the intellect, that is thinking. He will often talk about the Italian architectural historian Manfredi, uh, Manfredo Tafuri, who told him that, that nobody will care what you think if you don't build, and in the same way that if you don't think, nobody will care what you built. So would Palladio be so well known even today, five centuries after his death, if he hadn't written the Quattro Libri? Or would Le Corbusier be the first name that comes to mind when thinking about modern architecture, hadn't he written his provocative manifestos? I want to take a few more minutes to talk about what it means to question conventions in architecture. The unprecedented shift in spatial organization, the virus, the virus induced, shows us that our conventional distinction between workspaces and leisure spaces or other types of spaces is completely obsolete. What kinds of architectural proposition will follow remains to be seen because we do show some form of resistance or resilience, if you will, to change and overcoming this resistance requires intellectual disciplinary effort. We tend to resist against information that proves our existing way of assigning meaning to life might be false or fake. This resistance and resilience is shown to protect our personalities to avoid a certain destroying effect that can happen on the level of, of consciousness, that where we're conscious about it, or it can work as an unconscious mechanism, as a sort of reflex. This resistance can be observed both in our daily lives, while we draft plans, while when we want to put a bed where it's supposed to go, a corridor where it's supposed to be, or a staircase how it would fit the easiest. Or it can also be seen in historical events. The example of Europeans who sailed to Africa in the 14th and 15th century, naming the African statues they found there as fetishes is a useful illustration of this mechanism. The African objects were used as marks of social contracts and were highly artistic in their form. However, Europeans seeing those for the first time immediately called them fetishes to avoid the fact that there might be different ways of expressing social agreements and art, or that there might be different ways of living than the way they've lived before. Climate change deniers, who against all scientific data, keep defending a business as usual model, are another clear example illustrating the concept of resistance that I'm talking about. That is how this resistance works. It hides a truth. It covers up the possibility of an alternative. 
to how serious Eisenman did in the 1970s can be seen as a questioning of conventions in architecture, as a way of breaking this resistance. The house series explores the possibilities of a post-structuralist methodology in architecture. If you're interested in the subject, I would suggest starting with Roland Barthes' seminal an introduction to the structural analysis of narrative that I can share here in the chat section later. Post-structuralism, like all the post-isms, emerged as a critique of structuralism through the writings of Foucault, Derrida, Barthes, Deleuze, Judith Butler, Jean Baudrillard, to name only a few of the main protagonists. And even though they all had different ideas, an overarching theme recurrent in their writings was the understanding of texts as a fundamental element in our lives. Derrida famously claimed that there is no outside text, sometimes misunderstood as everything is text in our lives because of his translation from the French or text. He meant actually that everything one writes or does is bound by the sociocultural context in which it is produced. Eisenman's main focus in, er, among post-structuralism was on semiotics, namely the study of signs and symbols and their interpretation. The Houses series is the manifesto for an architectural methodology that would later be adopted by many architecture schools in especially the East Coast of the US and around the world in the decades to come. Particularly with digitization and digital ways of thinking, the process-driven method would find a very uh, a good fit. But the houses of uh, the 70s are a manifesto for Eisenman's dictum, process, not result. Hence, the diagrams of the houses are what's most important about them. The process is actually so much more important than the result that in house six, the couple's bed is split in two by architecture with a capital A. It's perhaps the first in history where architecture potentially saves a marriage. There is, of course, the famous Cedric modification of architectural elements is a little bit like Haneke's films. Take, for example, the film Funny Games. In the 1997 Funny Games, the five main characters perform in two juxtaposed genres. For the villains, the film is a comedy, it's a farce. For the victims, the film is a tragedy. Throughout the film, the villains have complete control over the film as a comedy, to the extent that when one of them is shot by the protagonist, one of the victims, the second, the second one, the second villain, finds in the living room a remote control to rewind the film to change what just happened also reminding us that we are, of course, in a film. What's so powerful about funny games, and in our case, Eisenman's architecture, is that the two genres of comedy and tragedy do not mix together. The villains do not exit the domain of the farce, of the comedy ever, and the victims that of the tragedy they live in. And the film hosts them both and even confronts them makes them interact. In a similar fashion, in Eisenman's houses, the domestic bourgeois environment of suburban houses confronts architecture. Eisenman, like Haneke, is not complacent. While traditionally architecture enables domesticity, here the architecture is making it difficult, forcing the occupants and the furniture to adapt. It's as if the occupant of the house is a stranger to her or his own house. Another important aspect of the house series is the fluidity in the mediums Eisenman's exploration opens up. Perhaps the strongest example of that is the axonometric model of house 10. This model is to my knowledge a first in understanding a model as a drawing and vice versa. The model is sheared so that when you look at it from a 45, 45, 45 degree angle, like in this picture here on the right, it appears as a parallel projection. The model is hence becoming devoid of perspective. 
While perspective subjectifies our perception, we can say that a parallel projection drawing, such as a plan, an elevation, or any oblique projection, such as an isometric or axonometric drawing, can be called objective. The play on the transition from model to drawing will be familiar with anyone who is studying or studied architecture in the past decades within digital ways of drawing and making. When we ask Rhino to do a Make 2D, the software performs exactly the same operations as whoever built the model for House 10. Now, if you really are into the differences between isometric and axonometric drawings, you will know that in order to get an axonometric drawing of a 3D model, you will need to shear it exactly like this model was sheared years before the first 3D modeling software was invented. But perhaps the boldest medium inversion Eisenman did was on a photo of House 2 that was exquisitely edited. Often captioned in magazines of its day as a photo of a model, this photo was taken, uh, quoting from Sarah Hearn's article on the photo, by Randall Corman, who was then an assistant in Peter Eisenman's office, who rented a helicopter, a Piper PA-28 Cherokee, from the White Plains Airport in upstate New York and flew it to Hardwick, Vermont. There, using the piloting skills he had acquired during his recent military service and a Konica SLR camera with a telephoto lens, he took a photograph of Eisenman's recently completed House 2 from above. All this to say that conventions in architecture are what we make of them, maybe. To know that to know the conventions doesn't mean to follow them, but reinvent and rethink them. And by doing so, reinventing and rethinking architecture altogether. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for, is that the end of the presentation? Yes. Okay, so uh, everybody give the virtual applause for Alishan. Um, so yeah so i'd like to keep uh, thank you for having the screen just to to have some more yeah. images and projects that keep rolling while we talk cool so yeah uh we're going to move to our virtual roundtable discussion uh which is we we will um introduce uh four other uh speakers who will join us Mm, okay, uh, I will I will invite them one by one and also uh, uh, reading about their their bio directly. Okay, the first one is Mr. Thomas Leeser. Uh, Thomas Leeser is internationally known for his iconic architectural designs and at all scales. Thomas' uh, commitment to architecture extend beyond practicing in the field. Uh, for the past thirty years, he has been an architecture professor at Pratt Institute, Cornell University, Harvard University, the Cooper Union, uh, Columbia University, Parsons School of Design, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Illinois Institute of Technology, and Princeton, Prince, Princeton University. He is currently teaching at Pratt Institute. Uh, Thomas uh, specialized in museums, theater, broadcast, and educational facilities. Thomas work at Eisenman Architects throughout the 80s and played a key role in the office. Uh, important projects such, such as the Wexner Center of the Greater and the Greater Columbus Convention Center. Uh, he also co-edited the book on Eisenman's La Villette project, The Coral Works, a collaboration between Eisenman and the philosopher uh, Jacques Arida. Uh, hello, Thomas. Uh, uh, you, sh you could join us. And saying hi to the hi, to the audience. hi. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is sort of a, a, a kind of for me very moving moment because Peter and I go back a long, long time, and um, uh, it's actually a little bit shocking to me um, because I I was there yes in the eighties until nineteen eighty nine ninety, which is thirty years ago. Um, uh, which is a long time, and, and so like I, I I actually hadn't really thought about how 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 long ago this is, um, and uh, I'm sort of trying to remember 
the time, you know, when, when actually I first met Peter was very funny. I, you just showed the New York Five Architects. I studied in Germany and um, this book was, of course, um, for, for me a kind of eye opener because, you know, German architecture education is very technical. Um, you know, you learn how to draw stairs and how to make roofs not leak and, um, um, and uh, you know, uh, things like this. And But I also knew, and I, I don't quite remember who said this or where it's coming from, but, you know, my father was an architect and he always said, like, if a roof doesn't leak, it's not good architecture. And um, um, so I, I saw this book and I, I realized that Eisenman's buildings must leak, you know, because... Um, uh, there, there was something about them, and I visited uh, uh, I visited his his uh, one of his buildings on my first trip to the U.S. and um, with my father and and uh, my father said like look it's made out of cardboard this is good architecture because it must be and, <laughs> and um, so I I eventually um, applied to Cooper Union to study in Cooper Union and 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 had Peter as a, in my very first class with Peter and he was reading Tafuri. Um, and my English was so bad that uh, I said to Peter, look, Peter, I don't understand the word. I don't think it's useful for, to, for me to take this class. And Peter said, don't worry about it. Nobody understands a word from, from of this text. So just sit down and, and, and stay with me. And as I stayed with him for 10 years, um, which, which was sort of, uh, you know, a, a very sort of forming time for me, I guess. And, and you know, Peter and I sort of collaborated on, on a lot of projects that, um, that have, you know, become, uh, for me, essential in my education. Well, oh, what a story. Uh, it's just flying back through the 80s, I guess. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to talk more about it. So, yeah, uh, we're, we're moving to an, uh, our second speaker, which is uh, Ariane Laurie Harrison. Uh, Ariane Harrison is an architect and educator. Uh, she is the coordinator of the MS programs in architecture and urban design at uh, Pratt Graduate. Uh, she worked at Eisenman Architect from 2006 to 2008, edited 10 canonical buildings by Peter Eisenman and thought at Yale School of Architecture from 2006 to 2017. She received her AB from Princeton uh, and her uh, Master of Architecture from Columbia um, GSAP, GSAPP, uh, Excellence in Design, and he her PhD from New York University. Uh, please, wel please welcome Ms. Ariana Laurie Harrison. Um, hello, hi hello. Randy. Thank you so much for the, for the invitation, and Ali Khan. Thank you for your your really beautiful, um, rich. Lex, uh, talk on you know walking us through so much of what what Peter has done and I, I think when you cited this term of a medium inversion a, a consistent reworking of the mediums as well as the inversion of the ideas it's I think a very powerful and I, I would say accurate reading um, I, I'll give a little uh, background as well. So I met Peter when I was just graduating from my MRC at GSAP. I had really, really wanted to uh, talk to Peter because I was interested in a French philosopher named Maurice Blanchot, who is allied to many of the schools of thought that Ali Khan uh, mentioned. And I emailed and called and like was not getting through. Um, I think this was a few months actually <laughs> and uh, and then Peter came to talk at uh, at Columbia and I thought aha you know he's here <laughs> I will talk to him he cannot he can't avoid me anymore and uh, and we after the lecture uh, we we started speaking and it turned out that Peter was actually very interested in Maurice Blanchot's work and I went to uh, work for Peter um, and taught with him at Yale in the advanced studios and then that that sort of morphed into um, teaching contemporary theory at Yale and that's that's really where um, you know Peter has given I mean the, the, the kind of foundations in not just the disciplinary conversations between architects which is one aspect of the book we did together 10 canonical buildings um, 
let me see, I could, I don't know if this is the place to talk about 10 canonical buildings or if that comes in a little bit later. I'm just not quite sure about the format here. We, can, we, can. we will, we will, mm -hmm. we will, okay. we will uh, talk about it after. The okay, process. so this is just hello. <laughs> Great. Yes, yes, it's very, very nice introduction how you met because to me, in person is always, always the, the better ideas, you know? Like you said, it's unavoidable, unavoidable. <laughs> part of my English. So the third one will be Elisa Turby. Uh, Elisa Turby is a critic at Yale University School of Architecture, YSOA, uh, where she also coordinates the dual degree from program between YSOA and uh, the Yale School of the Environment. Her, writing, her writings uh, have been published in Log, Dirk, and Pulp, in addition to a forthcoming piece in Perspecta. Uh, most recently, she, she guest edited Log 47 titled Overcoming Carbon Form, an issue dedicated to redefining the relationship between architectural form and uh, our dominant energy paradigm. She also uh, co-wrote a book with Peter Eisenman titled um, Lateness, uh, forthcoming in May 2020. As, as we know, it's already out now. In addition, she teaches studio formal analysis and a, a course on carbon form at the Cooper Union. She is a co-founder of Outside Development and Architectural Practice. Hello, Elisa. You could join with us now. Hi. Uh, Thank you so hello. much for having me. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, so I guess I should say how I met Peter. Yeah, maybe. It's yeah. Just, uh, um, so I met Peter when I was a graduate student at Yale. And um, I he was actually um, present in my very early education because um, when I was there, formal analysis was required in your first semester. And uh, so that was my introduction to Peter as his student. And uh, I really liked formal analysis as a class. I thought it really helped me make sense of what it was that I was supposed to be doing um, in architecture. It, it taught me what, you know, what the language was that was um, at stake and you know, the ways in which I could really start to um, manipulate space. And you know, it started to give me a vocabulary and a syntax. And so I became uh, Peter's TA and then I stayed with him in formal analysis um, for two years as I finished grad school. And then um, afterwards I worked in Peter's office and then taught with him. And so then I was teaching formal analysis with him and studio and a seminar. And uh, while I was at the office, we were also writing this book, Lateness, which, which you just saw. Um, so my relationship with Peter has been, um, you know, through, through work and through teaching, um, but uh, it also, you know, has, you know, it's been many years now and I think in the, in the process of working on a book together, um, you know, it's been a really wonderful way to get to know him. And um, so yeah, that's, that's how we know each other. Thank you. Um, okay, I will uh, introduce the fourth one. The last one will be Erdan Tuzun. Uh, I guess I actually familiar with him uh, when I was joining this uh, Fardia workshop uh, two years ago in La Biennale Venezia in Turkish Pavilion. He's one of the curator of Turkish Pavilion. Well, Erdem Tuzin is an architect based in New York, presently leading the design team for Eisenman Architects. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree at Istanbul Technical University and Master of Science in Architecture degree at Pratt Institute. Uh, he was awarded with the first prize at Cheherge Square Competition in 2017 and the National Architecture Award in Turkey with his The Giant Machine Project in 2016. Erdem was one of the associate creators uh, of Vardia uh, or The Shift, which was presented at the Pavilion of Turkey for La Biennale di Venezia in the 16th Architectural Exhibition in 2018. He is uh, a co-founder of Herkes Ichin Mimarlik Architecture for All, uh, a nonprofit and independent architecture organization based in Istanbul, devoted to offering solution to social problems from an architectural perspective. So, hello, Erdem. Hello, Randy. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, making this uh, like huge meeting actually, and Aljan for. Uh, <laughs> Also, thank you for the presentation and also the invitation. Um, since everyone talked about like how he, they met um, with Peter, actually, like my story um, like goes like way, way before like I started um, 
I, I moved to the US. Uh, actually, I was a recent graduate from high school and there was this international um, architectural uh, meeting of uh, uh, called UIA, I believe. And I was like 17 years old, like even though like my parents are architects, I had no idea about Peter's work and who he was. And I was like, in that summer, I was planning to move to Istanbul for my undergrad education. And uh, I, I, I knew that there was this event in Istanbul going on. Um, and like there were uh, and famous architects were gonna come and like make these presentations. And then like in one day, uh, I saw a photo on the, on the national uh, news, news, uh, newspaper uh, with, a, with a person who wears a Galatasaray jersey uh, in like in front of this huge crowd and like like and the and that title was saying that like world famous architect Peter Weizmann like presented his work with wearing with this like uh, soccer jersey and then like that's how like uh, like uh, like I like first first this was the first time that I heard uh, Peter's name and like started uh, making a research and started reading about him etc so this is this was like kind of like my first uh, uh, introduction to him and then like after I moved to New York and had my uh, master's studies in Pratt uh, they were working on like Eisen architects were working on this project in Istanbul uh, then I mean I was very interested in this project and basically I applied for a job and then Peter like wouldn't hire someone that uh, he didn't know like probably uh, like he didn't uh, taught or you know like had internship or anything so it was kind of a uh, hard time getting accepted in in the office but uh, probably it worked well uh, and I've been with uh, Peter in the last seven years even though like now we are trying to adopt working from a distance which is still, you know, like we're trying to figure out. Uh, but these kind of meetings are also, I think, helping. And, uh, you know, just to adapt and like see Peter like more often. Yeah, I mean, this is our new normal, I guess, but uh, this is the silver lining from the pandemic. I mean, five of us could do this roundtable discussion from different generation of Eisenman architects. It might not happen at all if we don't have this kind of things, you know, it's, that's, that's the silver lining, I guess. So yeah, uh, since uh, five of you are already here, uh, I, I would say to say thank you again for joining with, with our small week, weekly series, and it's an honor. And yeah, I, I will let Alishan to take over again to start the roundtable discussion. Uh, before that, uh, for the audience, uh, after, after the roundtable discussion, we're going to open uh, the Q&A for the public. So you, you could use your uh, raise hand feature in the management, manage participants. And yeah, uh, we, will, we, will, uh, we will pick the question after the roundtable discussion. Yes, Alicia, here you go. Great, um, can you hear me? Am I? Yeah, yes, you, you're yeah. on. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. yes. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly maybe talk about the Wexner Center. I, uh, I stopped my presentation at the end of the house series, and that's obviously only the beginning of Peter's career. Uh, maybe, maybe, I think Thomas was on this, uh, on the competition for, for the Wexner Center for the Arts, and um, could, you, could you share a little bit how the process of uh, working on this project was, uh, if, if, you, if you can recall? Um, how, well, how the process of this was, you know, it, it's kind of, um, uh, God, this is also a long time ago, but I remember, you know, in those days, the office was very small, um, and uh, we kind of, um, you know, this was obviously an important project, it was the kind of, uh, you know, uh, something that um, Peter and I, I, I actually think, spent days and nights uh, 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 conceptualizing and thinking about it, and and um, and I don't quite remember who the competitors was. I may confuse this with the convention center, whether whether um, um, you know 
who who actually uh, we were competing against. Um, but you know, it's always a kind of discussion. What you know, the the kind of the other architects would potentially do. And I think Peter sort of um, was very interested in in this uh, condition of be being between um, being between these two existing buildings. Some sort of classical kind of uh, one is an auditorium, and the other one I forgot already what it is. But these are the typical university buildings. And um, and uh, um, Peter, you know, and, and at the time we actually uh, we we called him or he called himself Mister In Between, uh, and that was sort of his his position in this project that uh, um, you know being between these sort of classical buildings and squeezing this uh, kind of landscape uh, um, uh, into to turn the landscape into an, an architectural proposition and to resurrect the old armory. In its kind of fragmentation, as as you know, because it had been erased, had been demolished uh, at some point, and um, um, of course, obviously, as we know, Peter's interested in traces and and readings um, um, that that sort of implied through the kind of architectural language. So this is this, this armory. You know, maybe it came it came out a little bit too real in a certain way, but at the same time. Um, uh, you know, it it is it is a it was sort of this this question of of um, this sort of past incomplete project and sort of incompleteness became something for me at least, uh, which is sort of an essential element of Peter's work and and has become also very much of my own work in a way that um, um, you know the the if you think of if you think of the early sort of cubes with the missing corner, uh, you know, this is always this, in, in the incompleteness lies the potential for reading what Peter called earlier things that you cannot see. Uh, and so here was this a project that, um, you know, this, this between those two existing buildings, it opened the possibility for things you cannot see by, by going right in between and inserting something that you, you, you would not know or would not expect to be possible. Um, and, uh, um, you know, these, you know the, the 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 grids. I don't need to talk much about the grids. I think we all know that the the grid is an important element in, in Peter's work as a kind of reading device. Uh, you know the grid of the city versus the grid of the university, which created these kind of two angles uh, in, in different scales of of uh, how this landscape um, um, sort of uh, inserted itself um, between these two classical dominant buildings, which would suddenly was kind of really interesting. These buildings were suddenly not so dominant anymore. Um, um, and there was this kind of disturbance in it, and um, so you know we worked day and night on this thing. And, um, and I remember, it's you know, funny stories like Philip Johnson. Uh, you know, Peter sort of every once in a while had this sort of you know conversation with Philip, and 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 so he, he, he Philip Johnson said one day, okay, I'll come by and look at the project. And he came and looked at the project and said, Peter, you're not going to win. I said, Peter, why not? Why not? And Peter said, why, why don't we win with this? He said, I don't know where you enter this. Um, and it, and uh, you have to put a big arrow on the plan which says entrance. Then you have a chance. So, of course, you know, we did that and um, actually won the project. So maybe it's thanks to Philip Johnson that we won this because we may have missed this, this uh, moment. But, of course, this is the very thing about Peter's work that you don't know where the entrance is, that, you know, that, that, that you kind of... Um, you have to you have to read a building before you can actually sort of uh, uh, understand it in a way. Cool. Um, well, is it the entrance? This white, um, the white bridge. <laughs> well, you could the end. No, this is not the entrance. If you pass, the, if you go into this, if you walk through this grid, uh, you basically pass the building. You miss the building, you know. That's sort of um, um, what's sort of you know interesting about it. And if you look at the image on the right, you see this white arch. It's also not the entrance. It's not so. It's not so. You know, it's not so in your face um, um, how to read this building. And and uh, um, I mean, this is what this is what Peter's work is about, right? It's not like uh, I guess um, um, what you know he would call strong form, like a classical building uh, has a very clear um, um, sort of understanding. Uh, uh, you know, and I guess maybe, maybe, um, maybe the difference between a canonical building and a great building. Peter's buildings are not great buildings, 
um, because great buildings are easy to read and easy to understand. You know, they're, they're, they're buildings that have to be read and have to be kind of deciphered in a, in a way. And that's what makes them interesting. So another question would maybe more directed towards Elisa and Ariane. Uh, how, how is working on a book with Peter uh, related to your current interests or how, how has that relationship been uh, developing? Um, I could, uh, Elisa, I'll, I can jump on that if we go a little bit uh, chronologically. Um, so when I was uh, working with Peter on 10 canonical buildings, we were also teaching studio at Yale, did a wonderful trip to Rome uh, to look at the archives. And, and so we were looking at a lot of work that we were finding in Italy. Um, you, you spoke about the Palladian Villa for example, and in working on the book, um, Peter was really describing this conversation between one architect to another, the way that what makes, you could take that term canonical and say it is part of a discourse uh, between architects about a set of architectural ideas that are transformed and inverted with each architect's uh, reinterpretation. Um, so I was looking at the Palladian villas and I was curious about Vidkover's um, lopping off the, the Barquesa, the wings that house the animals. <laughs> and my, my work, the work I do at Harrison Atelier is uh, I've written on the posthuman. I have, my built work is actually exploring ways to build for multiple species. So I could certainly find seeds of this that when you're reading and researching and writing the there are a number of ideas that fit in the book and there are ideas that do not. And so some of these hypotheses about why, um, what have architects also left out of conversations um, was very much part of 10 canonical buildings for me personally. And some of those seeds were what I took to ground uh, my work on the posthuman. And so I wrote a book, uh, an anthology with Routledge called Architectural Theories of the Environment, Post-Human Territory. And the concluding um, paragraph cites Peter's essay on post-functionalism, because again, the seeds, the seeds for one book sometimes uh, spread new books, if you will. So I think that's maybe a roundabout way of describing it, but hopefully I, I address that question. Yeah. and. Um... <clears throat> On my end, I, working on the lateness book um, with Peter was really wonderful. And we worked on it um, first in the context of, of a course. Um, Peter had already written an essay that played with the term lateness. And so, you know, we said, let's use it for the seminar. And uh, we told, we basically framed it with a preliminary definition of what we thought lateness might be. Um, and then we asked the students to bring in examples of lateness. And uh, it was it, it was extraordinarily um, you know productive and fun and it's a slippery term and just in the process of doing that um, we kind of define and redefine the term and we tried to do it according to different uh, periods at first we said okay what does what does it mean in the modern what does it mean in the postmodern um, and then we we did it as a studio and the ideas really um, evolved and we were able to do. Um, together this deep reading of Adorno's writing on Beethoven. And, you know, I think um, for me, what's, fun, what's the fundamental question that's at the core of this book is really what a paradigmatic shift really means. Um, what did it mean in music in Beethoven's time? What does it mean in architecture today? And um, I think Peter and I um, share a dissatisfaction with a lot of things about contemporary architecture. And so that question of sitting down together and asking what is the nature of, of this kind of change of a paradigmatic shift, um, you know, even if in the end, you know, I'm writing about different things and working on different things, that to me, there is this fundamental question of what is a paradigm shift and what does that take and what does it mean for a discipline? And, you know, it's interesting um, that uh, Alija, you brought up the question of convention and that much of what Peter's work does is a questioning of convention. And the word convention comes up a lot in the lateness book, actually, um, uh, because what Adorno argues is that 
Beethoven was not the seed of the modern in the moment that he was defying convention entirely, but in his late works, he returns to convention. And uh, it's in his questioning directly of the convention and then manipulating the convention in order to reframe the relationship between the parts. It introduces the idea of the fragment and that's the seed for the modern, right? So um, there is this question, I think, that, um, that comes up in, in the lateness book, which is that even our own attitude, attitudes toward convention can become normative. And, um, and that's something that has absolutely stayed with me and, and, and will stay with me going forward. Um. And Ardem, uh, you worked on the Yenikapu project, uh, and that has been an amazing ongoing project. I've also worked on it uh, a few years back. And um, could you address some of the the uh, interesting aspects of it? I remember, I mean, these very large scale models that are built at the office are quite amazing because they're uh, made of cardboard and and uh they're pretty uh high uh big in scale and what what, what is the model uh how, how is the model important in the design process uh, at the office i mean um i mean as you know it is kind of the, the, the one of the main tools that we use like even though like we we use all kinds of digital uh, tools parallel to that but it is kind of uh, the way that Peter also likes to uh, design and you know edit uh, things. Um, I mean, he like uh, also like test new ideas in that sense. And um, like Peter was actually like, mentioning this like his uh, story about like um, his trip to Italy about this uh, like Palladium Villa I mean, trip to Italy with Colin Rowe about like his, him standing in front of this Palladian villa and looking for something uh, that uh, is not visible there. Actually, I, like that reminded me uh, uh, what we were trying to do in Yenikova project uh, with um, actually looking, looking at Hagia Sophia uh, building and uh, extracting a grid which is actually not even there like uh like from a building uh, which was built um, like 1500 years ago like uh, kind of extracting a, a a tool a a, um, a conceptual uh, phenomena that we actually uh, borrowed and used in uh, yeni couple project which uh, is actually defining um the whole circulation, I mean, defining, starting from uh, the, uh, the site plan to the circulation of the, of the building or even like programming of the building. And if you zoom in, uh, like you can even like see the other like proportions of that uh, grid that we borrowed from Hagia Sophia. You can see it in the, like the millions of the, of the curtain walls. So it is kind of like uh, that. That story actually like directly reminded me our uh, process of like how we design and actually kind of cre created a uh, abstract uh, base for us, kind of a, like a rule, a computational rule that we generated our uh, our building design from that. And if like if you ask me if you can read it directly, like if when you go to the building, not necessarily like, I mean, you, you, you have to be like really familiar with Hagia Sophia, like even though like, if, if you are, if you know that those like both buildings very well, I'm not sure if you can relate it directly, but so that, that kind of connections that we always like, try to do. And uh, like, you know, I was just thinking like, how can you, uh, design something will not be visible uh, or like I mean, can you start with that idea in the beginning I mean maybe not but th these kind of like uh, tools that you mentioned like making tons of 
physical models and like analysis, the building analysis, like formal analysis of, of different buildings and kind of adapting the ideas to your design processes. Uh, actually, like way that I think uh, like we still use uh, in, the, in the office. Right. Um, now we might open, a, and I'm very curious to hear uh, questions from the audience. And I already see a few hands in the in the audience, but uh, maybe Randy, you, you want to moderate uh, how this goes? Yes. Um, okay, for everyone who actually has some questions for our five speakers tonight, or even just to, to say some thoughts or just to discuss something, please. Uh, put your uh, raise hand in in the participants menu, guys. <laughs> so yeah, they're still processing about the discussion that's going. Uh, I see. I see a question um, that's from Nathaniel, who's saying, "How does Henry Lefebvre's notion of social production of space compare oh, okay. to those of Eisenman's notion of decoding space?" Um, I, so I mean, I think okay. regarding that question, I'm. I, I think. Um, you know, it, it's a complicated one in a sense. And I think that um, if, if Peter were here, he would tell you that he's not really that interested in social processes that, that bring about the formation of, of space reform. Um, but I also don't necessarily think that that is a totally honest um, attitude on Peter's part, because for Peter, he's, he's absolutely interested in um, the ability of architecture to um, make you question your surroundings, which in the end is a is a political act in, in Peter's mind. Um, and so I think that there, there is sometimes a, an excess division between a you know formal attitude and, and a political one. And I think that something that Peter believes is that the um, the act of slowing down perception um, is is an important one and something that architects can contribute to a city. So in a context where um, the kind of conventional production of architectural form or of built form according to processes of real estate, you know, there are all of these um, normative and economic and political factors that that contribute to the shaping of the city. And in that context, the architect might be someone who kind of um, intersects something into that into that process, which can make you sort of stop and question everything around you. So I think that there um, there's something very important there, and uh, you know, for Peter, it's very important to not believe that the person inside of a building is a passive subject, right? Not a receiving subject, but rather a perceiving subject. And if we can heighten the act of perception, um, you know, as Viktor Slavsky would say, that the, the mind engaged in an intellectual process is less co-opted by power, right? So, uh, or less easily co-opted by power, let's say. And so I think that there's something there in what Peter is interested in, which I find very valuable. Um, I could also just chime in. I think we would possibly want to add another uh, French uh, profound thinker, Michel Foucault, because um, if we if we recall to uh, Peter's founding the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York in the 70s through the 80s as a think tank and the kind of writing that was published through oppositions, we would find a number of interesting engagements with Michel Foucault's writing. I think that what I would insert in that question is Foucault's suggestion that, that liberation, let's say th free thought is a practice, that architecture cannot build freedom, it cannot build the conditions of social liberty, it is, but it can build the conditions for you to think and and that that is where i think much of peter's discourse of analyzing cutting apart convention demonstrating a kind of conversation among architects who who pick out different points 
architectural elements, for example, a corner, um, an entrance, if you will, to not find the entrance of a building on some sense means you have to really think about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's consistently inserting these ways that it is not the architecture that is producing freedom like a product, but it is producing the conditions for the, the user of the space to think. And maybe that's uh, a name that we should, should insert um, into this discussion as well. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, would you like to move to another question? Or I can also. Uh, 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 yeah, there, there are two persons who ask now. OK. Uh, 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 yeah, I will uh, invite the first person. Uh, Yasmin, are you there? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, as you know, Yasmin, uh, maybe he's the first Indonesian who ever worked as an intern in Eisenman's, I guess, three years ago, Yasmin? Yeah, in t 2016, actually. Yeah. Hi, Asmin. Great to Hello, see you. Hello, Alicia. Really nice to see you. It was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you very much. You, also, Asmin. hi, Erdem and Elisa. Hi. Also, Mr. Thomas and Miss Harrison. So, I have a question. Since I, I hear a lot of the time when I was in the office, Peter and also Mirka back then, I uh, talk a lot about close reading. So, uh, and also, Alicia mentioned the term uh, earlier. And I'm really curious about that. And I uh, would like to hear, like, maybe any one of you can explain your uh, perception of this close reading in, in uh, Eisenman architecture since you have worked very closely with him so probably that would be my question thank you um, I could maybe jump on that because I think that the book 10 canonical buildings is very much I, I think it's it was an extraordinary project to work uh, with Peter on he had taught I think five years of seminars on how to close read buildings uh, while he was teaching at Princeton and the the book emerged um that 10 was a larger group that every every year working with students to scrutinize plans to look at representation to really start to read the the differences the ideas of the building as it was represented through its different architectural medium was was a process i think that peter has has always been involved in and has extremely generously um open to students, both in the formal analysis class that, that Elisa TA'd and in, in these kinds of seminars. So I think that, that one of the things I loved about working on that book with Peter is that there is a kind of framing essay um, that, that introduces the, the work that Peter has selected to, um, to analyze a certain discursive moment for each architect. And then if you turn to after the essay are a series of diagrams. Those diagrams have extremely sort of precise captions because he is taking you through a close reading of a work of architecture through diagram. So, so the diagram becomes almost the imposition of, I would, I would suggest Peter's own hypotheses or thought or narrative upon the work of, of architecture. So um, in a work, you know, and I'll just give you a super close, uh, small example. But if you, the first work that we looked at was uh, Giuseppe Moretti's Casa Gerasol in Rome. And there is a narrative in the book about forces, forces from the site really disrupting an ideal moment of a building that was really two blocks or loaves of space and the the diagrams articulate how the space is deformed it it articulates how a building can really flex and move but if you look at if you look closely at the diagrams it's really a kind of moment by moment sometimes it's an element on the facade sometimes it's a moment in the plan that deforms or you could look for any of you that have or will be going to Rome at some point to see the Casa uh, Gersol, um, you'll see that the Moretti staircase has a very strange moment. If you look at the section of the building as you're walking up the stairs, there is a gap between the second to last top stair and the landing. And so again, this idea that gets highlighted in the book that architecture is full of disruptive moments, of moments that make you think. But um, 
when you when you ask about this question of close reading the introductory essay the, the first essay that frames the book really talks about um, this story that that we we heard even today um, from Peter about a uh, Colin Rowe asking him uh, look at this building and tell me something that that isn't there that is something that you see that is the close reading I believe is is part of a process of interpreting an architecture, uh, interpreting a building with a narrative. And that, that narrative may matter to you in a different way than it matters to a different generation. So that, that is where the conversation, the discursive aspect of architecture continues. It continues among the 10 different architects in the book, but it continues with all of you as you use precedent to inform work. And I think that's another extremely important element of, of Peter's oeuvre is to, to suggest that the body of architecture, the discipline is extremely rich and allows us to um, work against the grain of prior architecture. It gives you some, some material to work with. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, may I also add uh, from my question? Because when I heard about uh, Peter's story about uh, being asked to see what is uh, invisible, like what what did you not see from that building? I feel like that kind of relates to this close reading idea. I think with close reading, we have to add a little bit of misreading too. <laughs> that well, we the, are. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. let me maybe you know this this close reading. Of course, um, the the. Uh, Ten canonical buildings is also very much about Peter's work because it's all about how to read Peter's work, of course. Right? Um, um, but it's sort of uh, when we did the um, um, choral uh, work project uh, with you know the book and Derrida and Peter and, and also Bernard Schumi, um, it was kind of very interesting because obviously there's you know there's a very precise text. Uh, about the kind of you know the, the philosophy and the questioning and, and you know and, and this this idea of architecture is text and you know as Derrida says everything is text. Um, what we did, uh, which got a lot of people very upset, is actually we punched holes throughout the book. One side is Peter's um, La Villette grid, and the other side is Trumi's. Um, uh, no, it's sorry, it's not. It's, it's, it's the Venice um, kind of retrograde, of, and. So so these two two holes meeting in the middle, and the, the beginning of the book is actually right in the middle, and you can read to the left and to the right. But people got very upset because there suddenly words were missing, and um, uh, and so this is what you were just saying, Ariana, that this this close reading is also your interpretation. You know, you, it's not it's not prescribed, it's not totally preset. It's sort of something you need to carefully look, and you make your own, you make your kind of own. Um, 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 reading of it, and I think this is sort of what we were trying to do in in choral works. That is, um, you know, that it allows that with the missing words allows you, for you to to fill in what you think this may mean or what it means for you. Right? And, and so I think that's sort of very, very important uh, that it's not prescribed because if if it's like too prescribed, it becomes like uh, it becomes sort of like a you know strong form. This is easy to read. It's the, the whole point is that it actually allows your own interpretation to, to filter in and, and, um, um, and, and create your own uh, reading of it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, and just to add, um, Peter and I still taught together again last semester at Cooper in the fall, and we taught a formal analysis studio. And, um, and then I also, you know, I TA'd formal analysis. I yelled with him for two years and then as a, a co-teacher for another two years. So you know, a lot of my formation was sitting next to Peter, reading buildings with him and with the students and having the students um, bring forward buildings that we had seen many times, but e inevitably every single semester there, there was some unexpected reading that, you know, both of us would sit there and be like, I never had seen that before in this building, even though we've already, you know, Peter has done this class hundreds of times. I had already done it, you know, five times. And um, so, I think that the there is something in close reading that it's also an act of invention. It's also it's an act of misreading, but also rereading, and about thinking about the relationships that are internal to the building that that can be generative of another idea. 
And so it, I would think of close reading always as generative. It's not really just about understanding a precedent and like memorizing the relationship between the parts. That's not what it is. It's about reinventing the relationship between the parts and reinterpreting them. I think these are great elements of answer to the question of close reading. Um, there, there's a question that if I may move on uh, between um, the saying, is there a balance between form and function in Eisenman's work? And if so, how is it created? I think it might be interesting to address uh, form and function because, uh, because well, you, you, you tell me. Um, I might have a story about that actually. Um, when I was a student and I was in Peter's studio, um, I was working with uh, a friend of mine, Brittany Edding, um, and um, you know, we, it was maybe the first week that we were presenting a design, and so you know, we said to ourselves, "Okay, this is it." You know, like we have to put together something like highly conceptual, something very, um, you know, something between abstraction and um and the physical and so we made we intersected two grids of course because it was an Eisenman studio and we extruded and we made this model and it was made out of two kinds of wood and it had all of these beautiful intersections and uh we we brought it to the studio and peter looked at it and he said oh my god are those are each of those individual towers like does each of those, and he totally misread the scale. He was like, does each of those have an elevator? Like what, how are you gonna circulate through that? Like what about light and air? And we were sitting there like, what, <laughs> is this the conversation we're having? Like we thought our model was like highly conceptual. And, um, and, and what I realized over time is that for, for Peter, a building has to function in order for it to transcend its function so that the function doesn't come up, right? But but it absolutely has to function because it's a building, right? And he will always say that architecture is not sculpture. They are not the same thing. Um, but the, the conceptual potential of the architecture does not have to be at the expense of it being a building that works. Um, and in fact, the opposite. If it works, then you don't have to talk about it. And that's, you know, you can just uh, move on to other ideas. Is there any of you guys have another story? related to uh, Elisa's opinion? Well, I, I, I could just touch on that, that I think part of the close reading raises a number of questions about how does the building function? function. I think in, in closely reading a building and its elements, one starts to understand very clearly that buildings are meant to function for some and not for others, that they have a series of prescriptions and there is a architecture is such a huge field it is not it is not hard to sail through your your education without asking a lot of hard questions about um, how a building functions for whom and one you could argue that that work such as the work I do asking why should it only function for one species um, I think that that grows out of this practice. Um, so the question of function is, I completely agree with what Elisa said that that it must function. But I think also in the close reading, the misreading, and in the interpretation, we have he gives us the tools to ask for whom should it function and does it function in an equitable fashion? Um, could we? How does that, that all of these tools of reading and misreading are, are ways to make it function uh, differently as well? There's of course also the, the, um, the question you ask about function. Uh, yes, as Elisa says, like, you know, the building has to function because otherwise it's sculpture. But they, you know, in, in, in Peter's work is of course also a lot of things that don't function. Um, we should also have to ask what is not functioning. I mean, if the, you know, the Wexner Center came up earlier, they are stairs that don't lead anywhere. They're columns that don't touch the ground. Um, you know, so there's a, there's this, uh, this this important question of of these. Um, you know, that one has not one one cannot take function as the kind of primary driver for the architecture. I mean, um, that that there are things that have nothing to do with function, and they're uh, possibly even more important than than the kind of conventional functional things. Okay, um, 
Should we move to another question, maybe? Uh, there are, uh, uh, okay. Olivia Emanuela, oh well, from Hi. Autonomous Studio. Yeah, actually, oh, okay. yeah, but he's, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay, doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just want to ask two questions actually. So, the first one is, how and why did Eisenman actually ended up using this Cartesian grid on virtually almost any mm. or almost all of his projects actually? Like, it's very prominent. Yeah, that's very projects. prominent on, on all of his projects, even if he's not obviously not the first one or the only architect who's Who's, who's, who's already considered this kind of approach, yeah, approach on mm -hmm. and and kind of uh, concerns of axis and grid um, in generating some kind of space in architecture. And it doesn't seem to, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be different in each context. Yeah, that and and the fact that it's it's mm -hmm. it's so prominent even when we took any of this building and kind of like represented it in any form of orthogonal drawing like the section or the elevation or the side plan even you can see this qualities uh resonating in each and every mm. aspect and the second one is like uh i've read an article about uh i forgot where it was but it was connected to his berlin uh jewish memorial and he mentioned something about uh the death on a of an author and the fact that he he had some kind of goal in eliminating a self-expression in architecture, but uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just curious about what that means and uh, why is it why is it important for him to kind of like eliminating this sense of out like uh, authorship in architecture in a way. Uh, yeah, I think that's the, the questions. Okay, that's two questions. Um, okay, uh, who wants to answer first? Well, please do. I hope you guys. Let me just uh, about the grid. Um, you know, the 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 uh, there is um, a lot in architecture. A lot of kind of discussion about references and so on. And most of them are the formal references. And Peter Peter's references are not formal. They they you know they basically like they're they're signed. So the grid, uh, you know, is goes back throughout history in in you know foundation of founding cities and so on the you know the, the cardo de Gamanum, um orientation to the north and south and so there's a reference to you know in in berlin for example uh, the uh, the 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 uh, war museum that was built the ref it references uh the, the the grid of the city of berlin and and in different kind of relationships the grid to the wall the the, the berlin wall was in a different orientation uh so it's 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 um um it's a kind of uh, it's 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 basically a, again a, a text by which you can understand how the project is situated against uh, a kind of historic um, 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 context, without using formal uh, you know like materials or shapes or, or sort of uh, short formal references. So so in a way it's it's kind of like so the grid is like a free entity where he could easily like. Uh, Overlay on top of any context. Does well, yeah, I mean, in Columbus, you know, the Wexner Center, the the grid is is the relationship of the city to the to the university campus. They're two different grids, that, you know, and so the campus is its own uh, uh, economic and political entity, and the city is a different economic political entity, and they overlay this. It's kind of you know, and, and the grid out of this overlay, out of the di difference between the two. Is generated a kind of in-between condition, as I sort of mentioned earlier, that that allows a kind of relationship between two entities. Mm. Okay. Okay. Anyone else want to put some addition? And what about the the death the death of the author thing? The second question. Yeah. Well, um, it's about an anti a kind of. And, and a move against authority, you know, kind of dismantle authority to to take down the kind of the architect as that super, as the superhero or the over the over um, um, figure in a way, 
um, uh, to kind of mm. to to destroy the, the kind of authority of of, uh, of the architect, right? And, and um, uh, so that's really important, um, you know, to 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 avoid a kind of uh, um, glorification of of you know this kind of master builder, which is the kind of traditional idea of what the architect is. Mm. I also think it has to do with this idea that a work has an infinite possibility of readings, right? That the author is not the authority as to the meaning of the work, but rather that the work, once it goes into the world, um, will constantly be read and reread an infinity of times and its meaning will never be stable. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah, my cousin who is a sociologist also just texted me, it might be because of uh, Foucault's uh, text uh, who, again, in post-structuralism defense that uh, words and texts also become or can become uh, authorless. Uh, and, and that might be linked also to Eisenman's uh, adaptation of the thought into architecture. Um, I think we could also add to that that question of uh, the death of the author, the implication of, as Elise, uh, as Elisa was saying, an almost infinite process. So if you, if you start with a house series or you go, you know, if you really look through Peter's work, including his extremely early anticipation of the digital, I think with uh, biology, the biology centrum, I think I think he did that with, I think that was with Greg Lynn has an interesting story about sort of manually um, developing a digital process. But the, the idea would be that there is a process rather than an author. There's a series of moves or instructions that, that can unfurl um, without, again, the strict authority um, that uh, that I think is is kind of an antagonist in a lot of Peter's work and thinking. Yeah. Okay. How is it, guys? Yeah. yeah it's a very interesting key yeah. point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question, uh, Rico and Olo. Uh, moving to another question, I will uh, please Timmy says no. Are you there? Ah uh, yes, good evening and good day, everyone. Um, I would like to ask the panelists about the idea of um, inducing questions when people uh, um, experience the, the space that we design. How does one induce such question? And does confusion is one of the main factor that plays in inducing such question? And does the question is meant to be unanswered, unanswered and unanswered um, question, or does it have an answer? Thank you. Okay. Any of you? Well, I, I think um, confusion is not necessarily uh, the 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 a necessary strategy. I mean, it's a possible strategy. Um, and I don't think that there is necessarily an answer either. I think it is most important uh, to, to um, when confronted with a piece of architecture like, like Peter's work, um, that one is, is, is raising questions that, 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 may, um, that may impact or, or interest or concern yourself. Uh, and the environment and the political context in which you're in, um, and and there is so there is no prescribed question. It's not like that the design produces a particular question, and there is no answer that particular answer. But it is it is the design, or the you know the work is there to to um, make you aware of things around you in a way that you know if you if you look at a sort of you know sort of strong form architecture, if you look at the you know, Bill Bauer project, you know, it's like, yes, this must be a museum. It's, you know, it's a certain kind of architecture. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of, it doesn't necessarily question much. You go in, you know, just because the type of architecture must be a museum is sort of the answer. 
um, and uh, uh, more complex works makes you more wonder like why is this or what is this and the questions are um, basically have to be answered by your own questioning this is not the architect cannot provide the answer um, um, you know no no a kind of specific question I would say hmm. Yeah, I would say that confusion is not the the only path towards asking a question. And I think that um, for me, a lot of this has to do with thinking about an architectural work that, whose meaning is open. And um, so, you know, as we think about that as architects ourselves, um, do we assume that we know the meaning of a thing or do we accept that its meaning will always change over time. And, um, and I think that um, there are so many different strategies to make uh, a, a person who enters a building to question something. And it may simply be about um, making something seem slightly unfamiliar. It could be subtle, right? And um, I think that the, um, the desire to make sure that people are questioning things is not a desire to incite confusion, but rather a desire to encourage a kind of alertness. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's interesting to see um, how complex spaces can actually, you know, inspire and, and make someone curious and, 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 you know, interested in moving through a space and um, that doesn't have to be through disorientation, but rather it could also be through curiosity. So they're, they're just infinite modes. And I would say that um, a, a desire to force questioning is not oppressive or um, you know, necessarily uh, fetishizing something negative in order to be transgressive, but rather it's the recognition that the person who is inside the building is a thinking subject. And I think it's also to honor the, the thought process of the person that's there. And I think that sometimes um, there's a discourse right now that says that an overly complicated architecture is, is undemocratic. And I think that that can be true in certain cases, but I think it also um, doesn't necessarily always honor the intellect of, of the person moving through the space, right? There's also a question of, of like, how do we make sure that spaces are um, you know, delightful to to so many aspects of the human mind, right? Um, it's not always so simple, and I think that um, the yeah the the desire for questions to be a part of an experience can be more about um, wanting to encourage a kind of variety of of experiences moving through a space, which can then in themselves have an open meaning. Right, and the, the change from one space to another can mean many things to many people. And so it's always assuming that there isn't a single meaning um, or a single experience or a singular experience. And we could, we could also say that we could take all of these, um, all of these points from uh, Tomas and Elisa and say, there is more to a building than walking through it. You know, we have a wealth of documentation that I think part of what Eisenman gives us are so many examples of architectures performing their own questions through their drawing. We could look at Bramante's redrawing his buildings prior to publication, or um, in the chapter on Le Corbusier that we did on 10 canonical buildings, and this actually touches on uh, the lateness issue that, that Elisa um, has been writing on and publishing on. Um, he shows us with the Palais de Congrès of Strasbourg, an example, his, Peter's narrative is that Le Corbusier set forth initially a very clear set of methodologies, the five points, super clear, you know, we all know them, but then by the end, to, as he, as his, as he's aging, as he's thinking through uh, his career, I think he was do, working, I forgot the dates of the Paris de Strasbourg, but um, he starts to question and starts to invert his own precepts. And there is an argument that the Palais de Strasbourg is actually an overturning, an inversion, an undermining, a questioning, if you will, of his own extremely strong and clear five points. 
So I think the questioning is not, first of all, I would, I would argue that the, and this Palais de Strasbourg was never built. So this questioning is always in a drawn form, in model form. So maybe to your, your what you raise, um, asking about questioning a building as you move through it, we could say, let's also include the questioning that comes from working through the documents, especially, you know, today we are in remote locations with travel to buildings incredibly curtailed. So it may be that close reading of architectural documentation um, becomes a more important way um, in social distancing to, to interpret, to think through a building. Um, but the, the, so one is that let's also consider all of the other elements that make architecture, um, that are documents from books as well, to drawings, to models, et cetera. And let's also uh, give, give some space for not just the user of the building, but for the architect um, him or herself to, to question their own work. And, and I think Peter shows us with a lot of generosity how that, how that process can happen. So the questioning is not for you as an audience, it is for us. And I, and I think that insistence on an us, that architecture creates a community that is questioning, that is responsible for, cert, for, responsible for themselves and trying to practice a kind of liberation of thought is, is one of the things that, that I, I have certainly gotten from, uh, from my, my work with Ivan. I think these were really great answers. I, I just want to say on a very tangential note that uh, there is this piece by uh, the modernist uh, American music composer, Charles Ives, uh, called The Unanswered Question uh, that I really love. So I would just say like, listening to that is great. Uh, we, we can move on with, with the maybe with the last question. I know we have a lot of questions in hands and uh, but maybe we can take one maybe two questions and then try to wrap uh, up if possible. Yes, uh, I will play for Daniel. Uh, Daniel is our previous uh, speaker, actually. He talked about Luis Barragan. Hey. Hello, Daniel. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I cannot turn on the video, but um, nice presentation, Alison. I really like the, the axonometric model. It still fascinates me, the complexity of uh, analysis. Um, this is more like an anecdote that I have. Uh, I met Renato Rizzi when I was living in Venice, and uh, he gave me this book called um, The Asian Man Empire and the La Muraglia Ebraica. And he talks about the reference, or not, not the reference, but the um, relation of Peter Eisenman with uh, Walter Benjamin. So my question is, I was reading yesterday the end of the classical and um, the end of the beginning and the end of the end. I'm still confused. I mean, so complex. But my question is, is the relation with religion a continuity of historicity? Is it still a reference, religion, or should we be total nihilistic from the Nietzschean point of view? Should, should we deny religion in order to be uh, atemporal? I mean, I'm confused. Uh, because Renato Rizzi says that uh, Peter Eisenman is totally linked with uh, Jewish uh, religion. But then his rational thought is against the repetition of 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 history. I mean, I'm I'm a bit confused. Uh, I don't know who could who could help me to kind of answer the, this question. I mean, his relation should be. Should we still be, should we still be talking about religion or? Can we, I I might have an an anecdote and it's it's an ill-formed one and Thomas may may know the story better but you know I think that Peter is extremely and has always been extremely interested in rigorous modes of thought and so if we think about uh, the Jewish religion has 
a an entire structure of questioning that that the deeper you go into Jewish um, orthodoxy, the more there is a questioning, a very rigorous um, set of questions. And we could talk about religion. We could also ask about Peter's interest in psychoanalysis and that he, uh, as legend has it, um, had a Jungian and Freudian analyst at the same time and at times would pit them against each other. Again, you know, we, we could say that this is, this is an engagement with the sciences of of thought, the sciences of mental health, but also um, a restlessness in committing to one body of thought. So I, as you're describing um, Peter's, I, I'm not sure I would agree that Peter's work is, could be contained within an envelope that's, oh, this is Jewish thought. I think he engages a tremendous amount of concepts and vocabularies from a variety of religion because religion is one way to structure thought. It's it's a, a structure and a system, and we could even say it has um, algorithmic capacities. And I, I think that's that's where I would maybe steer your question because to me it's not so much one religion, it's religion as structured thought. Among, you know, we could talk about music that Peter also has a, a deep understanding of that that we could look at a lot of other ways of thinking in addition to religion okay yeah. so it's more about um accessing to knowledge as a more as a process of thinking to create i mean religion religion could be a model music could be a model uh, psychoanalysis could be another model it's just um uh, analyzing and it's not one psychoanalysis. There's, you know, in, in that little idea of pitting the Jungian and Freudian, it's a way of showing there is no model here. There are many models. We can, the interesting thing becomes to play them against each other and understand, again, what are the conventions? What are the conventions? What misrepresentations can yield greater forms of, let's say, liberty of thought, breadth of audience, you know, and if that makes sense. <laughs> maybe, yes, maybe you need to talk to Renato directly. I, I know that Peter very much disagrees with Renato's readings, um, but uh, you may want to contact Renato and discuss it with him. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I also remember what Peter said uh, about the Holocaust Memorial. He really wanted to embody the, the, the religion itself and the, all the symbolism of, of Jewish out from the buildings, I guess. Yeah, it's, the religion is not really a piece of represent from Peter, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you, because you also, sh I think, uh, Alishan showed a number of churches too, that Peter has designed a church for the year 2000, I think. I mean, I, I don't, I think, I mean, I wouldn't rest with religion. I, I would suggest <laughs> it's more structured thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alijan? Oh, it's Daniel. Fair. No, that's, that's I, I'm all. okay. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. Maybe we can take the last all. question um, okay, from cool. uh, Ermak Chifchi. If, if, if you're okay. here, are you here, Ermak? Hi. Hi, guys. Congratulations Hello. on the great presentation. Um, and I have to say the discussion is super um, entertaining. Um, and very interesting. Um, um, I guess my my question um, goes back to the discussion about function, and also um, um, the idea of posthuman, which Ariane. Excuse me. Talked. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Hi. Okay. Um, Hi. Um, the the idea of posthuman, which Ariane talked a bit about in the beginning. Um, so Peter Eisenman formulated post-functionalism, uh, which allows um, architecture to decentralize um, the humans from their place of privilege. Um, so I guess my question is, how does Eisenman's work address uh, its non-human subject? And I was wondering if you guys could talk um, more about how does um, his work entertain the idea of um, post-human in relationship to post-functionalism. 
Okay, that one's for Ariane. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it's it's a great question and to be to I'm you know I think that who oh, where to start? Um I think that there are many ways that Peter's work points to the decentering of the human. At the same time, I think that Peter is incredibly invested in an articulate thinking being. Um, and we don't really know how to communicate that well with things that aren't human. We barely communicate with all humans as it is. Um, so, so my sense is, uh, and this is not a discussion that I've had explicitly uh, with Peter about the post-human, but it's, it's, there is a, an idea about inclusivity, about broader audiences that I do feel is inscribed in Peter's work and that is very much present in the, in the post-functionalism post essay, as, as you mentioned. Um, and I think that I, I, I would suggest Peter has certainly showed ways that architecture engages that if you think about his... Um, a lot of his amazing work on Piranesi, for example, we have, you, we looked at, we were looking at the gold plan of the Campo Marzio, but those drawings of the Piranesi did of the Campo Marzio, Peter has amazing analyses of uh, Piranesi's grotesques, um, the Campo Marzio, and in them we find inscribed many different forms of life, intense plant life, intense animal life, and um, and actually many different layers of society. Again, if you look at those prints quite closely, you'll see all forms of beggars, everything, all the entities that were marginalized from the center of the cities are reinscribed in um, in those Piranesi prints. So um, I, you know, I don't, I would not have an answer about how his built work engages that directly though you know i think that if i thought about it i could make some arguments for that but i would say that in in the work he studies there's certainly um uh tendencies towards that inclusivity that that i think encompasses the post-human thank you okay so Ali Chan? Uh, I think we can okay, wrap that's up. A, yeah. yeah, that's the last question, so uh, we will write it up. Um, okay, I would love to say thank you for all the speakers and participants who joined. The first one, uh, I would love to thank you for Mr. Peter Eisenman himself, who actually is still staying until now, uh, passively in, in this uh, meeting, and also for uh, all five of you guys, for Alishan, for Ariane, for um, Thomas Leeser, for Elise Turby, for uh, Ar uh, Arden Tuzun. Okay, five of you guys, thanks. It's a big appreciation uh, for the Indonesian audience uh, for, for, for giving and sharing about all of your experiences towards Eisenman architecture, and I hope it will also inspiring us in, in the audience uh, in the audience of Indonesia and some other international areas. So uh, I would like uh, before we wrap up, I would like to to read some the the, the, the conc I don't know the, like a small conclusion or maybe it's just some thoughts uh, that I re uh, that we wrote. Uh, it's like this. Uh, in conclusion, we can realize that there is also a certain meaning in every project in architecture that maybe we cannot see only from our eyes. Uh, questioning normality is also necessary to overcome projects, yet knowing conventionality doesn't mean you must follow it, but it must be known because you will learn from that and overcome it and exploring new possibilities. Uh, one of the thing about regionalization in history of art uh, process is what driven the architecture of Eisenman that later adopted by many schools in the world process driven architecture. Uh, medium inversion is also an idea inversion because different medium has different idea behind it. Relationship with ideas is one of concept that push the limit of architecture itself. 
we explore ways from ideas allows for interpretation. Uh, there are a lot of unexpected readings. Ideas are not just for understanding precedent, but reinventing the readings. Uh, yet at the same time, a uh, building has to function before it is transcending the function. If it works, you don't have to talk about it. So yeah, I guess um, that's all. <laughs> um, very nice to have this, uh, this uh, tremendous uh, evening for Indonesian for, for, and also morning or uh, afternoon now in, in, in the United States and also uh, early evening for some of you guys in Europe. So uh, I guess that's, we should write it up, write it up now. Uh, I would like to introduce myself again. My name is Randy Hendrawan. Uh, I'm on behalf of Rabung Mada with the others. Uh, we have uh, Akbar Junaidi, we have uh, Fikri Rajalisa, we have Sufi Kar Ibrahim, we have uh, Stefania Dolorosa, we have Gilang Fajar Gusma Wardana. Uh, all of us are from Rabung Mada. Rabung Mada is an architectural collective in Surabaya, Indonesia that has a passion together to continue the architectural movement. Having anxieties and trying to bridging the distance between conceptual and pragmatic, because we believe that architecture can depart and come from anywhere. And our big dream is to build an architecture civilization in Indonesia. So thanks for all of you guys and see you in another, uh, another weekly lecture series of us. So we get upcoming more speakers and also architects to talk. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Great work, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, and once, we, we, once we can travel again, we'll all come to Indonesia and talk to you in person. Yeah. That's for sure, Thomas. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, this was great. Good night. Bye.